Uh, so we're each going to just take a couple of minutes to introduce our, ourselves uh, and uh, not make speeches, but uh, we're here as resources uh, to further the conversation wherever you guys decide that it should go. Uh, and how long so, do we have uh, for this meeting? I don't meeting? know how long we have. Does anybody know how long we have? Now we're at 4.30. Right? Four four so we have a little over an hour. <coughs> so what's yeah, the time? Good. Um, so uh, I've been a member of uh, the local Venezuela Solidarity Committee in its various uh, iterations here since about 2004. I guess 324. Um, and. Uh, uh, I uh, also uh, work with uh, Newton San Juan Sur Sister City Project and uh, a related uh, junior high school and high school project in uh, Nicaragua. So I've been working in Nicaragua for about 20 years and just got back from a three week uh, work trip uh, a, a few days ago. And uh, the uh, three other Folks up here who are here for the research people for you will introduce themselves. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi. My hi. name is Jose Aleman. I am from El Salvador. And uh, I am also a member of the Boston Venezuela Solidarity Committee, which I think is well represented for one important reason. Uh, I think Venezuela is uh, at the heart of the Trump foreign policy of intervention and regime change, but Venezuela is not the only one. Uh, as we said, Cuba and Nicaragua are also part of what they describe as the Troika of Terror. And today, I am talking about uh, Cuba. Cuba, and the reason is, or my credentials for uh, speaking uh, about Cuba is uh, not only that I was there uh, just two years ago, observing the changes, I lived in Cuba for 11 months at the heart of the blockade, or not the blockade, at the heart of the transition, the Periodo Especial, back in 94, 95. And I am also a member of the Frente Farabundo Martí para la Liberación Nacional, the political party that is still governing El Salvador, and it has been doing that for the past 10 years. I serve as the council general for four years, and uh, I can simply say that many of the gains that have happened in El Salvador have been uh, the result of the positive Cuban influence, changes in board, uh, reforms in healthcare, education, literacy, sports even, uh, have to do with uh, the Cuban influence, which has been positive. And uh, just to say one more last thing about why speaking uh, on behalf of Cuba or for Cuba becomes a relevant point is that when I was in 95 in, a, in Cuba, I was not as a tourist. Um, I was indeed helping a number of Salvadorans, war wounded Salvadorans, to return back to El Salvador. After years, perhaps for some of them, of medical treatment, because as you remember, we we fought a war from 1980 to 1992 that ended in peace accords. And Cuba was by far, if not the only one, the most reliable uh, place for humanitarian uh, and medical treatment for our war, our war wounded uh, fighters. Um, and I will leave it there uh, by saying perhaps one last thing. Uh, there is now in the news this rumor that Cuba is the support of Venezuela, and if without Cuba, Venezuela will fall. It's true. Important resources like oil, but also Wi-Fi, internet access, come uh, directly because of an understanding and agreement with Venezuela, the Venezuelan government. Those two economies, those two countries are indeed entrenched, are together, are united, and any, any attempt to say the opposite is false. Cuba and Venezuela are indeed tied. Cooperation, support is evident, and it is not just the military support. And I can talk more about that as the questions start. Has anyone uh, not, who's here has not signed in? Okay. Okay. Uh, 
go ahead. I would just, just to brief some quick, just a couple of minutes. Oh, okay. Well, uh, uh, we in Nicaragua, I've been involved in public health projects where we build the stoves. Well, the villagers build them under the guidance of our Nicaraguan employees. But we built 1,300 stoves with chimneys to prevent women from cooking on open fires in enclosed spaces and uh, 1,300 household water purification systems in uh, 32 of the 33 villages surrounding our town of San Juan del Sur, Nicaragua. And uh, we have, uh, we built half of the elementary schools in the villages and then gave them to the uh, Ministry of Education. And uh, we have the only junior high schools out in the villages and uh, we have a private high school, and our educational facilities are the only <coughs> educational facilities available to the majority of the students who take advantage of them. It's their only opportunity for education. That's why we have them. So we work in the areas of health and education. And this time, of course, the visit to Nicaragua was different because the entire country is under extreme tension and stress because of uh, anti-government demonstrations that started in April were put down by the existing government uh, and uh, there is a heavy state of repression now you can't criticize the government uh, right now and uh, the economy is on the ropes uh, our town in particular being a tourism town is down about 70 percent uh, and uh, mm. so it's a very difficult time uh, all around, and you find the Nicaraguan uh, population very divided and split uh, politically on the various options that lie before them at this point in time. It's interesting, I spoke, uh, uh, maybe people are willing to speak to me, they don't speak to each other right now, uh, uh, partly because I'm leaving, I'm not going to be around to gossip. Uh, but. Uh, at any rate, uh, all of my acquaintances and colleagues were very forthcoming with their views this time. Uh, but it leaves one with a terribly unsettling feeling because the views were all over the map. Uh, uh, and uh, it remains to be seen where things will go. But I did find one thing that everyone seemed to agree on, uh, no matter their political um, stance at the moment, and that was that if the U.S. is able to bring down the government in Venezuela, they'll redouble efforts to uh, get rid of the Ortega regime in Nicaragua. Everybody seemed to think that was uh, uh, made, made sense. <laughs> so, uh, Mike Clark? Yeah. Sure. Uh -huh. um, yeah, my name's Mike Clark. I'm the pastor at the Methodist Church in Watertown. But in the old days, I was um, on the staff of Witness for Peace from 1907 to 1993 was the executive director, 90 to 93, when we moved from Nicaragua into Guatemala and to Chiapas. And, and so I was there when we took the model that we developed for 10 years in Nicaragua and began to apply it in other places in Central America. And so I have that background in, in Nicaragua. But between 2004 and 2014, I also made seven trips to Venezuela and uh, to observe uh, developments there. And so it was twice um, uh, on the late President Chavez uh, television program, Al Presidente, and um, was interviewed by him twice, and so I had the chance to, to meet him over the course of those years. Um, three quick observations, though, about each time when I came back in 2004 and 2014, I tried to do a lot of speaking, I tried to talk to people about what was happening in, in Venezuela. So three observations. One is that but from the very beginning of the Bolivarian process, um, which begins with uh, Chavez being elected in 1998, uh, it was clear that Venezuela was going to be in the crosshairs. Not only what was happening inside Venezuela, where there were also those, uh, those tensions and those conflicts, um, but it also represented what else was going on in the hemisphere at that point. And during the 10 years that I was going to Venezuela, obviously the, the whole picture of of South America changed in terms of political orientation of the elected governments, and um, there was a, a leftward uh, movement, each their own social and economic uh, 
development, each um, indigenous to their own individual realities, but also, in a sense, inspired by what was happening uh, in Venezuela at the time. And so the first great crime uh, to the U.S. Uh, was that the model of Venezuela was one that others would be inspired by. But the second thing that I observed there over the course of those 10 years was that the United States um, was also multiple administrations, it doesn't matter if it's centrist Democrats or, or right-wing Republicans, uh, the consistency over the last 21 years is pretty clear. Um, but the relationship of Venezuela and other nations in this hemisphere um, with the rest of the world. And so concerns around, particularly around Iran, I, and for a number of the times that I was there, uh, Venezuela was portrayed as the cat's paw of Iran in this hemisphere. And so all these issues, as we all know, are connected, and that was uh, a theme that was rather consistent um, uh, for a period of a number of years. Um, now, the nations that have continued to support the legitimacy of the Maduro government, you know, right at the very beginning, China, Russia, Iran, um, and three quarters of the nations uh, in the UN General Assembly, for example. So uh, a quarter have come to Guido's side, but three quarters of the world uh, still recognizes Maduro as the, the legitimate president. <coughs> but the concern with uh, Venezuela's uh, relationship to and interactions with the rest of, of uh, the world. Uh, then the third and final thing, uh, over these years, the work that I was doing, the kind of interpretation I was trying to give, looked at all the different techniques the U.S. was using to destabilize Venezuela, blockades and sanctions and coups and, and all the rest. Um, but most insidious in some ways is the present effort around uh, humanitarian assistance. Because our neighbors, who may not know very much about Venezuela, and that's my guess, if you see 20 million dollars worth of humanitarian assistance at the Colombian border that's not being allowed in. And you're trying to explain to someone what may be going on there um, and why the Venezuelan government is not interested in having it come in. And if people don't have any background or any context for explaining it, <clears throat> that black looks rather cold heart. And so I think after years of looking for a theme that works and failing, uh, this is one that for average people who are not following events uh, very clearly seems like, well, isn't that like what a human being does? And so I think one of the challenges for the present moment um, is to, to find ways to put that in context um, so that people can then make up their own minds, but so that they have adequate information to know what's, what's taking place. So just those are my three observations about uh, the present moment but growing up in whatever experience I've had. And finally, Andrew King. Um, I'm a, a doctoral student at UMass Boston. I'm from the area. Uh, I've been loosely involved with the Venezuela Solidarity Committee over the years, ever since first seeing the, uh, the Revolution Will Not Be Televised film back in 2005. Um, how many folks have seen that film? Let me just get a sense. <laughs> Um, you know, I think never before in history has it been more true that uh, the extent to which someone, someone or some place is being attacked by the establishment is a measure of uh, the good that person is doing, is a measure of that, that uh, individuals uh, willingness to speak truth to power and uh, speak up. So we see the attacks on Elon Omar and Alexandria Cortez. And there is no one that is being demonized more right now in the mainstream media than, than Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro. Um, there's a reason for that. You know, I I uh, I think we need to oppose U.S. military intervention in Venezuela in all costs, but we have to understand that the cause is behind it as well. Uh, you know, that Venezuela is, is under constant attack now for 20 years uh, because of exactly the opposite of what the U.S. empire and media empire has been saying, uh, that Venezuela represents a threat to the corporate elite and the elite democracy in this country. We don't have a democracy right here. Uh, elite democracy and a plutocracy, folks have been saying 
and, and Venezuela has been trying to establish a grassroots democracy, a participatory democracy, which many folks, you know, yeah, I think even in the peace movement aren't quite aware of. You know, Venezuela uh, established thousands of communal councils. They gave grassroots decision-making power to people in, in the slums and the barrios. Um, you know, Chavez was the first president in the Americas to embrace his indigenous and African heritage. Uh, you know, Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, who right, was democratically elected in, in, in 1998, uh, is arguably the most important revolutionary figure of the modern period, right. the 21st century. Uh, he's akin to what Fidel Castro was in the 20th century. And in the peace movement, I think we have to take a stand and, and, and study that history. Um, right, this uh, Venezuela was not just like any traditional Soviet socialism. It was led from the ground by the indigenous, by the poor, uh, by the black and brown Venezuelans. And that's what the 1999 Constitution, the first social crime that we committed against the, the, the Washington Consensus established. It established free health care rights and, and social, cultural, political rights for the socially excluded. Uh, as a young person, I was very radicalized and inspired by this Venezuelan revolution. And it pains me to see the way that the US media has blacked that out. Because that means many thousands of young people who might have joined the Bernie Sanders movement have no idea what the fuck, because sorry, pardon my language, has gone down in Venezuela. And, right, and they, they think it's just you know, some, some messy dictatorship, but that perhaps U.S. shouldn't meddle. Uh, they, don't, they don't know the, the very beautiful and, and, and revolutionary history uh, and the beacon of light that Venezuela was. Venezuela arguably made more social progress from 2000 to 2015 than any, any nation on earth. Um, you know, That's granted right. they've been mired in deep That's economic right. crisis nice. due to the sanctions of the U.S. and many complex factors we can we can discuss, but uh, you know we need to study that this history and the peace movement of the last 20 years. And and again, as they said, the Alba Alliance. People don't know about that. I mean, Venezuela put into place major anti-imperialist infrastructure. The Telesur Progressive <coughs> Network comes out of Chavez in Venezuela, uh, and so on and so forth. So I'm in there. Um, so now we're uh, open for discussion, but remember that the uh, motivating factor for this discussion was, does MAPA want to uh, do anything a little more systematic or, or organize itself in a way that it would be more prepared <coughs> to respond to upcoming Latin American related events uh, than it is without any kind of a working group to, to deal with that. Uh, so we're available, of course, for questions or clarifying information about Latin America or these countries that we're concerned with right now. But more importantly, uh, you know, we're ready to move on to your thoughts about what MAPA might do or not do or should do or shouldn't do or could do or couldn't do, uh, you know, on this Latin American theme. Uh, it seems to me it's self-evident that the answer to your question is yes, and that in fact, given the kind of threats that they that they that the U.S. assaults in Latin America can mean mm -hmm. on our attempts at sustaining a peace movement in the country, there needs to be a response. And given that I think that's self-evident, I would hope that we could spend some time today also talking about what that means, what we can do, not okay. just answering the question of what do we do. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I agree that we should do it. Um, part of my, what I struggle with is how, you know, we're, people are feeling strained already because mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. organization is fighting on so many fronts, but that's probably what happens when you elect somebody like Trump. But the, um, um, it's really to me not even just Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. To me, in the last uh, few years or so, the United States has been systematically working in, to overthrow or diminish or beat back 
the progress that had been made in a whole number of Latin American countries. Mm -hmm. And they've had enormous success in places that hadn't gone as far as Nicaragua and Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Like they were able to engineer this parliamentary coup in Brazil and the arrest of Lula because Brazil would have been a major factor supporting mm -hmm. uh, Venezuela otherwise. They somehow, in Ecuador, the transition between Correa and the new guy who's the president there, who was supposed to be from the movement but turned into you know, something else totally. Um, and then there was... Um, Honduras in 2009. That's uh, right. Honduras is where it started. In a way. Hillary, Hillary Clinton's yeah, soft yeah. coup. Yeah. But, that, but in a way, that was... Honduras never made it there. Honduras was beginning right. to move there. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these other places were part of Alba, were part of the effort to to move forward, and they were overturning them. So I think mm -hmm. we need to focus on the broader picture somehow when we mm -hmm. begin to... I guess Argentina is the other big example, and maybe the first opportunity to try to push back. Mm -hmm. I think it was setting their timeline in a way they wanted to do something before Macri had to face another election. Or something. That might have moved that thing out of the way. But, um, you know, there's so much to do here, and it is. We have to figure out what we can do, what we can focus. I don't know whether we can be like a Latin American Caribbean solidarity or something, but focused on Venezuela, because right? that is clearly the in the crosshairs, and Cuba and Nicaragua. I think the focus should be Venezuela. I agree. A few weeks ago, I went to a demonstration at Park Street, and it was rather small against intervention in Venezuela. And so while MAPA stands for uh, you know climate change uh, concerns and anti-nuke, <laughs> To me, the more you can focus on the immediate threat, which for me the most immediate threat is intervention in Venezuela. I always think back to 2003 in Iraq. That's the equivalent for me now. Mm -hmm. And that I think the more people that are out demonstrating about this, the better. So I would prefer a focus on this particular dire immediate mm -hmm. threat. Um, yes, uh, I'd like to play a little bit. <coughs> you have to speak louder. I'd like, like to play a little bit of devil's advocate here, okay? Uh, my <coughs> son and I agree on most things politically. He's very progressive. Around the issue of Venezuela, though, we've really, you know, fought hard against each other, other than we agree that the U.S. should not be involved in any military intervention. He has called uh, Chavez. Um, somewhat of a dictator, but Maduro more so. He said that Chavez was elected legitimately the first time, but there's questions and doubts that the second election was a legitimate one. Uh, the third thing, and he's questioning the issues of democracy. He said that Maduro uh, was not elected democratically in, um, you know, nations throughout the world have opposed his election in Guido, given what has happened in the legislature, I don't know what it is that they have there, should be the legitimate uh, head of state there. Um, so we've, we've gone through this, and um, I can't, you know, with facts, uh, def you know, state that I don't agree, but I told him, as far as I'm concerned, Godot is somebody, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced his name, but from what I've heard when he was interviewed, was legitimizing military intervention into Venezuela. And I said, that would create a civil war. The blood is on his hands. And for him to say that, that's the alternative. When an offer was to have negotiations was there, he didn't accept that at all. I said, I don't trust him. I think he's a puppet of the U.S. military intervention. So um, I'd like some help here when I talk with my son and other young people, because he's got friends who happen to be Venezuelan. He talks about the issue of how the, the, the economy was, was ruined because of Maduro and, you know, 
and as well as um, as um, Chavez because of mismanagement and as a result you have more poverty there, you have people leaving the country and this is all a result of them and you don't have that in Cuba. <laughs> so, you know, I, I have a hard time trying to in some way argue against those issues. <coughs> uh, if I can just say a couple things. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I would say that it's, there are no sound bites about this. It is 21 years of history, most of which has been invisible to us, including in the peace movement. Uh, there was not a comparable solidarity movement of the breadth and width of uh, the 1980s around Central American wars. There simply has been not that here for 15 years. So we're all doing catch up, and that means there's no sound bite. But on the question of elections, if, I, if you're somewhere here, I'm sure he's a nice man. Um, if he were here, I would say this. Um, there were 15 uh, national elections during the, the time that uh, President Chavez was uh, the president of Venezuela. Um, Venezuela is an interesting system in which they have every mayor in the country gets elected on the same day. Every governor gets elected on the same day. Uh, the president, the vice president. So they have these national events that take place. There were 15 elections during the Chavez um, uh, administration. And the left won 14 of the 15. Um, the Carter Center monitored all of those elections and said that of all the countries in the world where they monitored elections, including places in the U.S., the Venezuela best electoral system, the most capable of being free of fraud of any system they have examined in the entire world. You can find that on the internet. And, and so, so <clears throat> that, that's just a fact. Um, and in fact, uh, both gubernatorial and mayoral and, and presidential elections, uh, 14 out of 15. But I was there for the one that didn't win. So let me just say a word. And I made four speeches in two weeks, and if you heard me before, uh, I'm sitting well, to you. Go okay, fine. <laughs> um, so I'm here in 2007, and they had 56 amendments to the Constitution proposed. It was like the short version of War and Peace. And, and you had to vote on all 56 amendments at one time, on one day. And it was daunting. And I'm glad I didn't have to do that. Uh, but the Venezuelan people had the chance to do that. 56 amendments. 1 a.m. in the morning, live on television. I'm in my hotel. Chavez comes on. He says, OK, the results are in. He goes, we lost by one quarter of 1%. Congratulations to the opposition. And the struggle continues. Now. If I had an election that only required one quarter of one percent to finesse a different result, that would have been a great opportunity to do that. But instead, if Chavez came on and said, they beat me by a quarter of one percent, congratulations. And that was it. Uh, every single election in those 15 years, the Chavistas said, whatever the results are, we'll accept it. In not one of those elections in 15 years did the opposition say they would accept the results of the election in advance. And so the, the present situation with Maduro, ran for president last year, um, three parties, um, they were disqualified the year before because they had boycotted the election, so they had to be recertified. One got enough signatures to do it, so they could be in. One got signatures, but not enough, so they couldn't. And the other said, if we boycott it, we're, we're, the whole thing is corrupt, we don't have a part of it. And so the United States encouraged three major parties to boycott the election so they could have a press conference the next day and see we said it was rigged. The one guy who ran against Maduro, uh, Henry Falcon, who was the governor of Lara, the province in the western part of Venezuela, um, he got 21% of the vote. Um, and the United States was threatening sanctions against him because he was running for president in his own country because it went against our recommendation to make the thing look like a sham. And so this is not something you could solve in four minutes, yeah. but those are, those are simply my observations, some of them firsthand and some of them at a distance. Okay. 
Um, on this question of the election, Maduro's 6.8 million votes that he got in May of 2018 uh, turned out to be 31% of the eligible voters, which is what Obama got in 2008, and it's actually more than he got in 2012. So it wasn't um, or rather good. And that's so, because of his point card. That's right. And so that's all I would say is that there are things that we can say, and that's not to, to say that everybody's going to accept that, but there's so much information missing from our picture. And I will never forget him coming on TV and saying, hey, I lost. Okay. Uh, and uh, I, I must add, add that, and uh, I was an election monitor in the 2006 presidential election in Barquisimeto, the third city, about four, four hours or so west of Caracas. And uh, so at that station, there were three ballot boxes. And uh, uh, this is the first time, I believe, in the entire world ever that the majority of ballots were. Uh, uh, hand counted the second time of which was this election. Uh, so, in our case, you had uh, two, uh, three ballot boxes, so you had to monitor two of them in order to do a majority of the votes had monitored. So, uh, people from uh, all the political parties who wanted to be there were there. You could be there to watch in person. We had a representative of your party there to watch the monitor. So, you vote on the touch screen and uh, you immediately get a receipt, a printed receipt, that tells you what you voted for. So at least you have that assurance that, that uh, I pushed that button and indeed it says here that I voted for who I thought I was voting for, and then you get that. Then at the end, uh, they to do the recount. Uh, oh, and then they, the machine also prints a duplicate of this receipt. It goes on the file. So there are like 350 votes in, roughly in each box. So at the end, then, the, the machine, the old vending machine, prints out the receipt. It's about uh, 12 feet long, a single receipt. And it has uh, every vote that everyone cast. It has their schedule number, their name. It has who they voted for. It's grouped by parties. It has party subtotals. That particular time, there were 54 parties who had presidential candidates. Um, <coughs> many were for Chavez, many for, were the one leading opposition figure, and then there were some right parties that had small, separate candidates. Get the subtotals from everything, then they sit down and they go through the entire pile of the 350 pieces of paper that were printed out, <coughs> and they match it up against every item on the receipt to make sure that the receipt matched the actual post. Anyway, it's uh, something to behold. So anyway, when they say, when all these observers around the world say that they have the cleanest election or something, that, that, that's a lot of the reason why they say that. Uh, oh, oh yes. sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. I don't have a, an elections uh, testimony to give. I'm glad you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, think about what yeah. we're doing. We are talking about sure. Chavez and what happened. Instead of talking about the United States and its intervention all the time. Exactly. We do not focus here. We do exactly what the leaders in this country, the establishment, the bureaucracy, the plutocrats want us to do. They deflect us. We do it all the time. Forget that. You objected, we all objected to the Iraq war. Saddam Hussein was a dictator. I didn't hear any notes, right? Nobody, you know, we can go through the whole damn list. So stop doing it. Let's get to the point of what we can do in the United States to stop intervention in Venezuela, but in other places. We're doing it all over the damn world. Thank you. Uh, yes, it has to do with Thank you. Uh, well, I'm glad that there is energy for WAPA to do uh, something. You suggested you focus on Venezuela because it's more attending uh, under meeting. Uh -huh. But the question was very specific about military intervention and how we are horrified by that possibility. And every day I check Telesur and the news to see if there are troop 
deployment. If the neighboring countries have moved troops to the border, because yes, that's indeed kind of the, the fear that we all have. We, I have survived a war, and I don't want to be in any war in my life. And if I have a chance to give an advice to anybody, it will be stay away from them. <laughs> they are painful. And at the end, when you count the pluses and the minuses, what we lost as, as humans is so much that nothing will gain it back. So, the, this is my, my, my point is, this is not just fear of a military intervention, we need to talk about economic sanctions. Because they have been in place and conference. That's true. For years and years, and President Obama, who some of us still regard as good president, was the one in 2017 who said, 2015 I think, who started this attack to weaken the Venezuelan economy, to put people against government in Venezuela, and we haven't said much. You said, okay, is the time now not to review all the attacks and all the aggressions of this country against Venezuela. It's a time to say what we can do. Uh, last year, the Venezuelan Solidarity Committee met with uh, Jim McGovern, and he listened to us, right? Were you uh, there, Richard? Yeah. <laughs> and he uh, said he would get back to us. <laughs> Nothing has happened? Well, he did get back to us. He got back to us and he said, the United States Congress has done absolutely nothing regarding sanctions in Venezuela. The United States Congress has no sanctions on Venezuela, which indeed was true. And uh, he said he would be willing to write a letter to the uh, Treasury uh, objecting to sanctions, which he did, uh, because the sanctions aren't exclusively executive sanctions, uh, as were the sanctions under Obama. Uh, and it's an, another interesting aspect of what's happened in the presidency, I guess, in our country. Uh, the, the sanctions have devastating effects. Uh, estimated at $30 billion uh, cost the economy last year, compared to the $24 million of aid that was sitting at the border, uh, and has estimated to have far more of an impact, on negative impact on the economy this year because it has added uh, transactions with the state oil company to the sanctions. Um, so they are absolutely devastating sanctions. I wanted to ask, is there, a, is there now an like economics or what kind of related group in MAPA is there now that management could plug into rather than having a new one? Would it dilute something to have a new Venezuela or, or, I don't know. Good question. Go ahead. Um, well, this isn't exactly an answer to that, but uh -huh. I, I think that we should, you know, if nothing else, by the time we leave here today, we should agree that there's a list serve mm -hmm. that we should. I assume, are you t taking well, we got charge of all this? You're going to uh, sort of chair this effort for a while. Well, or for, whatever. for at least a week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I do think it should be Latin America and, and uh, uh -huh. you know, yeah. the, the whole hemisphere. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and for that matter, it can include, include the NAFTA 2.0 too. Uh, and, and that we should consider trying to set up another meeting. Uh, because a lot of this is going to require a lot of deeper discussion and sharing of materials and knowledge and everything, you know. Okay, John. What? Well, I don't know. I have five minutes. If I, have minutes, I think um, there is a piece of legislation now in Congress that uh, I uh, forget the guy's name, but he's from New Jersey. Sicily. Uh, Sicily. Yeah. He's from Rhode Island. Rhode Island, okay. Close to New Jersey. It's, <laughs> it's uh, 1004, I believe, House Resolution, that where Congress can speak out against these administrative sanctions. One of the interesting things to me is that oh, Obama... No, no. It, that Sicily legislation is no military intervention. Oh, it is, is it? Not <coughs> it's not a military intervention. 
then we need to work on trying to get something in there that would. But that's still important to ask yeah. for. Um, it's also the, significant that Jimmy Bell with Seth, Seth Moulton and Ayanna Presley have signed on to that. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's great that we have a place to start. Yes. But um, I think Kennedy and, you know, we should try to get something going in the Senate. There's a lot that we need to do ahead of us, so I agree with the need for the next meeting. But it's, to me, it's interesting that what Obama did was exactly what Trump is under so much criticism for doing on the Mexican border. You know, he declared a state of emergency yeah. because the United States faced a foreign threat from, and it was that state of emergency that gave him the power to put these sanctions on. You know, Be because of the influence that Chavez had in Latin America opposing U.S. military or U.S. Imperialist dictates. Well, That's yeah. my understanding. Well, right. that is what um, you know. If you were a U.S. imperialist, you might see it. But he, this is these state of emergencies are supposed to be emergencies for the whole country, the nation. You know, which is why Trump had to talk about the floods of immigrants and all this at the border. You know, it, it, there, there should be a threat to the nation, which is what Obama said it was. But it was a threat to the control of our banks over Latin America, maybe, yeah. you know, but anyway, that he used those powers, hopefully out of this nonsense uh, on the border, we can get some way of attacking those emergency mm -hmm. powers and the fact that the president can do that. What I'm concerned about a bit, uh, more than a bit, is what just happened with the power thing. Because I, I really think the U.S. might be this is the experimenting yeah. its, with its yeah. Yeah. You know, they've always talked about war these days. It's not just on the battlefield, but it's in, you know, with the computers and it's in space and all this. And this could very well be an example of using the computers like they tried to do. Everybody knows about that. Does everybody know that there was a major power outage? Yeah, it cut out the power and the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Eighty percent of, uh, of Venezuelan electricity has been off for two days. Right, and they get it all from this huge dam, centralized dam process, you know, hydroelectric energy. And so that's something that can, we know can easily be attacked using cyber attacks, because they're trying to say Russia is threatening our cyber system, you know, with their, their stuff to try to build up, get more money for this, their cyber warfare components in the military. So I think we, you know, that is, an example of something that goes beyond sanctions that is really a military attack or, you know, although it's being done in a clandestine fashion. And I think we really need to, I think we need to expose that and back up what the Venezuelan yeah. government and says, remind the American people about what our own government has boasted about. Okay. And how are we going to do that? That's my point. Okay. We, we have to keep, you know, narrowing down. How are we going to get done what we know needs to be done? We had a thing on na on national security. We found out today that we are a national security state. What does that mean in terms of empire in the whole damn world, not just Latin America? Because we've been there for national security. Yeah, but I do think we have okay? to focus. I, I, I'm not saying yeah. not to, but I think we have to understand the deeper things that we are facing and strategically, how are we going to do the work that needs to be done in terms of reaching people, educating? The word ignorance that was thrown out there is true. We yeah. are ignorant. You know, yeah, that, that, we went crazy about the cages, the kids in cages. Mm -hmm. We have a whole history of taking kids away from parents. We've been doing it since the founding. Yeah. Whether, and they're all people of color unless they're poor and the parents went to jail and then they put them in, you know, in other places. That's our history. What does it mean? What are we going to do as U.S. people to understand what empire means, what it means to be in a national security state? And, you know, we can say all of this stuff in terms of exposing. How do we do it? That's the question. Speaker is back to the same question is should we have a group that discusses this or shall we be or, or not? You know, and I think yeah. we need to do some kind of a vote or something in order to 
Uh, why don't we do that now and see and uh, what show of hands how many people think we should at least have a temporary uh, Latin American working group within MAP. So raise your hand if you think so. And Can I ask you a question for clarification? Yes, of course. Can people introduce yourselves kind of as the experts? <laughs> uh, well, uh, what kind of interaction do you have with other Venezuelan support groups and perhaps it shouldn't be MAPA in isolation but that there should be yes. some kind of Boston, Cambridge, New England right. well, they, group. The, the, That's the, what the, last, the last two events that MAPA, I guess the first two events for a while, Latin American events that MAPA uh, endorsed and co-sponsored we're co-sponsored with our Venezuelan Solidarity Committee. So that's the one and, you mentioned. And, and we're, we're members, <coughs> Andrew is a member, uh, and uh, oh yes, you're a member. Uh, so so uh, that relationship is well established and ongoing. Uh, uh, so we have that relationship. Um, and they were the ones that wrote the article in the newsletter. About right. My point is that you know that we wouldn't form this new group, but that we would kind of have well, some kind of coalition. So that that is the idea. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. That MAPA would act in concert, as as it has in these first couple of events that we've just done. MAPA would act in coalition with other groups. Okay. That's the idea. And actually, Definitely. Yes. And actually, kind of become part of that, and not have like parallel meetings or anything like that, but actually have cool meetings with them. Make it a little bit less burdensome well, time-wise. Uh, yes, I was one. I was wondering about that too because uh, I guess on Venezuela for the moment uh, it is our Venezuela Solidarity Committee that would be the you know the group uh, to work with mostly on Venezuelan focus and. We have our monthly meetings uh, at 11 o'clock on the first Saturday of the month uh, at Encuentro Cinco, right at the, uh, at the uh, park, uh, tea stop there. And I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering out loud here with my <coughs> colleagues if uh, one thing that we could do right now, or I mean we could invite anyone who's interested to join us at our next okay. monthly meeting. For example, uh, last Saturday we met a week ago, and a representative from the PFL, Party of uh, for Socialism and, and, and Liberation, yes. came, interested in for precisely developing a coalitions. And previously, also DS, DSA has been also co-sponsoring events, open to uh, provide information and mobilize the base, which apparently is a large base in the, in the Boston area. So there is, I think, energy to work on this together, number one, because the, the issue is big, and the threat is, 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 is imminent. Every day things get worse, and this is not time to, to see who is bigger or stronger. No, but those are the exact times that Wilf meets the first Saturday at 11 to 1, so it's kind of a conflict. That's the Women's International League of Peace and Freedom. Yeah, but I, that, that is one reason why it would make sense to me to have a group within MAPA that is meeting. We could get reports from Vincelcom about what happened at the last. Those of us who could go could go to that. But we also have certain things that we do that, um, like Wilf does also, that maybe there's not as much experience in other sectors of peace movement. For instance, we have relationships with all these congressional offices. We've been after them on nuclear weapons. We've been after them on the Middle East. But when we approach them, we should also make sure we include what needs to be done around the Venezuela. And there's, there's going to be a national march on Washington it's the 16th or the 15th. Yeah, I think MAPA is endorsed, so I'm not going to be aware of that. So yes. we're talking about action steps. April or May? Next Saturday. Next week. In next week. 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 Next
Uh, just so that everyone knows, uh, the, the next meeting of the Venezuela Solidarity Committee is Saturday, September 6th. Why don't you send I mean, that out to MAPA? I'll MAPA send it out to this mailing list. Yeah. No, what about all of MAPA? All of MAPA, okay. Yeah. That's that's good. Good. The Solidarity Meeting? Yeah, the Venezuela yeah. Solidarity yeah. Committee well, Meeting. Well, the yeah. only reason is it's, you know, the meeting space is relatively small. Their list is 5,000. I don't know how many people would come. I think that the whole list is usually if we want people to turn up for a demonstration or an activity like that. Yeah. No. But we, it wouldn't hurt to do it or include it in, because we might pick up a few. Right? Well, I, I want to go back to what Gene was uh, asking about. It, it seems to me, at least, that um, that we'll need to do what we always do, which is education, work with Congress, public demonstrations. Uh, there's a pledge sure. of resistance card circulating. I mean, and let a hundred flowers bloom. Um, but that some are more urgent than others. For example, right now, <coughs> even the Lima group has said they're not in favor of a military invasion. This is our moment to get a couple of Congress people in Massachusetts who haven't signed on to that to do that, which says we're then collaborating with a general sense of what's going on in the world that we're actually reinforcing. And you can say, this is not just however many Congress people in Massachusetts. We're doing this, and even the nations that don't like Maduro have said a military invasion is not a good idea. So it shows that we're consonant with, with that and, and that we're getting some energy from that. Then there are things like the sanctions. The sanctions, I think, are how this is, this is the most dangerous part of the present moment. Venezuela is already struggling. <coughs> this will make it more of a struggle. And if Guido dies tomorrow or goes to Miami and opens a, a vegan tapas place that's trending on, on the internet, it, it doesn't make any difference. Because the sanctions are going to starve more Venezuelans. They're going to create more social disruption. And even if he never existed, he was never born, uh, that's how the screws 